happen we'll uh, we'll pray and stuff yeah okay father we we thank you lord for this day god we thank you that lord from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same lord your name is to be praised father god we thank you lord for who you are lord in each one of our lives father god we can never thank you enough lord and we can never be lord grateful enough for oh god for all that you have done in our lives and all that you continue to do father god lord to that we are so grateful lord we give you praise father god we thank you master and lord even right now lord we we come at today's class lord classes all the classes into your mighty hands we pray that you would continue to draw us lord to yourself continue to speak to us father god yes lord i just pray father god that uh, lord let there be a um, deep work in our hearts lord lord we ask that um, lord let the things that uh, that need to fall away let it fall away let the things that need to be established rooted in our hearts lord let it be established in our hearts father god yes master we pray that um, that, that our walk with you will be real lord that our walk our faith oh god will be authentic god and i just pray father god today for a for a reassurance father god in each one of our hearts lord of your presence in our lives lord for the reassurance oh god of um, lord your work lord in our journey with you master uh, lord i just pray for that reassurance from your word from your presence lord in how we pray oh god we, we you want to do it god just do it lord we thank you oh, we thank you lord we give you praise father god let us spend some time in his presence just asking him to speak to us even right now um let us ask the spirit of god to to write upon our hearts um let's ask him to you know um just impress upon our hearts something some aspect of whatever we've been you know seeking him whatever we've been asking him um let's just uh, ask him for that let's just spend some time just yeah just waiting upon him thank you jesus thank you lord you yeah, have gone thank you father oh almost same again today yes lord our hearts long for you jesus yes father god come holy spirit have your way lord we realize that every word oh god lord in the scriptures lord breathed by you inspired by you we pray that you would lord quicken your word to us to our hearts today and so we come with expectation we come with faith thank you thank you lord thank you father Yes, Master. Lord, we we just continue to yield, continue to surrender, Lord, to your leading, to your guiding, to your prompting. And I just pray, Father God, that uh, Lord, that you would do in our hearts, God, what we have not physically, Master, in our natural senses received. Lord, we pray that we will receive in our spirit, in our inner man, through the work of your Holy Spirit, Lord, what has not been revealed to in the natural senses, Father God. Yes, Master, speak to us. Write your word upon our hearts, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We give you all the praise at this time. We give you all the glory at this time. In Jesus' matchless name, we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Yeah, may the Lord uh, speak to us. May the Lord reveal His heart to us. You know, um, right in the middle of our, uh, you know, life situations, uh, circumstances. Um, yeah, we believe that. You know, we're not, we're not worshiping someone. We're not, you know, engaging with someone who cannot speak to us, who cannot lead us, who cannot cause us to have victory. Lord, in the you know, in the midst of difficult circumstances, situations. So, um, yeah. So may the Lord speak to us, you know, at the point of our need, and um, you know, in the midst of life situations, right? Yeah. Okay. So, where were we last class? We looked at uh, First Corinthians chapter two, right? I think that's where we 
kind of um, the first few verses of chapter 2 i think um, yeah maybe till about verse 5 is where where we stop okay okay so uh, so where where was paul when he wrote uh, first corinthians he was in ephesus so how long did paul stay in corinth, corinth prior to that No, in Corinth. How long did Paul stay in Corinth? Uh, yes, 18 months. One and a half years is when he stayed in Corinth. Three years is uh, uh, three years is Ephesus, right? Okay. So, yeah, one and a half years. And then, um, so who was with Paul in Corinth? No, no. Luke was there with him. Yes, correct. Who else? Who else was there with Paul? He met someone in Paul, in Corinth. Yeah. Okay. And Nina says Aquila and Priscilla. Yes. Aquila and Priscilla. He met at Corinth. You know, and the Bible says that um, they were tent makers by trade, so they all, you know, um, and he would have definitely, you know, kind of uh, worked. And sold it in the marketplace, which was called the Agora, and so on. Yeah. And um, who else was there? So we read about. So when we started, you know, um, with uh, when we started reading the epistle, we saw in chapter one, Paul, through the will of God, uh, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. So Sosthenes, at the writing, uh, Sosthenes was also with Paul. So most likely. You know, he also accompanied Paul uh, from Corinth to you know all the other places, right? Um, so if you if you if you look at Acts chapter, um, I think Acts chapter eighteen, it it talks about you know this person. Acts chapter eighteen and uh, verse seventeen says that uh, there was this person by name Sosthenes who was you know who was with Paul at Corinth. Right, so he was one of the people whom um, he, he was a ruler of the synagogue, and most likely because of the ministry of Paul, um, he came to the Lord. Right, and here when, um, and most likely that he joined. If it's the same person, he joined Paul on his journey from Corinth onto Ephesus and so on. And so, you know, when he's writing, he's uh, he's also there. Okay, so Shaya says uh, Silas and Timothy. Yes, they were also there. They joined later. From Macedonia, right? So, so all these people were with him in Corinth. Okay, so, um, so he's writing to the Corinthians. Now, why is he writing to the Corinthians? Any idea? Correct. But he's in Ephesus now. What prompt? What prompts him to write? You know, according to what we see, what prompts him to write? He's writing to if you if you go through if you just you know just skim through Corinthians, First Corinthians, you see that he's writing about different things. One is about, about division, division of course. Then he writes about immorality. Then he writes about you know several other things, um, uh, you know about marriage and so on. Chapter seven and then spiritual gifts, you know twelve to fourteen. So he's writing about different things, um, and so he's addressing you know certain maybe challenges issues. Um, difficulties and setting right certain things, right? So, but what really prompts him to write? Maybe one main reason. What prompts him? We, there is a there is a verse. The, we saw that scripture verse. Maybe you can look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and see that if there is anything, that is any clue, any hint that is there. No. Um, there, is a, there is a hint there somewhere. Yeah. 
Ähm, Conform. Maybe not in chapter one. <laughs> <laughs> But there is a, you know, there is a clue where he says, hmm. Anyone? Now I'm not able to find that verse, but that clue is there because of which he is, you know, he is prompted to to provide guidance for the members of the church. Yes, those are some things. What he was hearing about the church in Corinth. Yeah, so that's the thing. But then, how does he come to hear uh, about what is happening and you know some of these problems that are there in the church, um, and then because of which he is prompted to write. I think. Okay, look at one Corinthians chapter one verse eleven. Who is this in chapter one? Chapter one verse eleven. Okay, can somebody? Yeah, Nina, that's uh, that's right. So, so it says, for it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. So there is. So Chloe. And uh, another member of the church, part of the church at Corinth, and her family, her household. So they send information saying hey, things are bad, things are difficult, things are challenging. There are divisions. There are these kinds of problems. So he's, you know, when he writes about these things, he's actually addressing those problems, so like based on, um, you know, Chloe and. Uh, Chloe's household, whatever report was given to um, uh, to Paul, right? So, so that's the thing. So that's what he says. You know, I, it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, that those of Chloe's household, um, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Okay, and he and that's that was the main thing, and uh, he starts to write about that. Right? Okay. So let's um, yeah, let's look at chapter two. And um, the verses that we uh, kind of, uh, you know, quickly summarize those verses that we saw, chapter two. Okay. Um, okay. Um, yeah. So he, he he starts by saying that he, when he came to Corinth, when he when he came to the believers, he determined not to, you know, prove anything to them or show anything to. He wanted them to know the the power of God, okay, not just wisdom or not just mere words, but the power of God is what he wanted to. Uh, you know, he says, "I didn't come with excellence of speech, right, or of wisdom." And he says, "I determined that you not to know anything among you except Jesus and Him crucified." Okay, and then verse four, he says, um, "My speech and my preaching." Were in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. So, whatever the Holy Spirit's demonstration was, you know, in, in life-changing experiences and maybe addictions and chains being broken, deliverance, um, you know, minds being cleared and healing and emotional, physical, whatever, it was a demonstration of the Holy Spirit, and he wanted them to put their faith in that. In the power of God, right? So he says, you know, this is what I want. It, it was in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Verse five: that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Okay, so that is that is where I think we we stop, right? Um, verse five. Okay. So which means we we understood, you know, we kind of the learning or takeaway for us is that we also. You know, just like the early church, uh, all the early disciples, the early apostles, and uh, the emphasis that they brought to their ministry, right? The the emphasis on their ministry was was not just you know words, mere words or information, but it was revelation of the Holy Spirit. It was the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit, right? And their their focus was, you know, your faith should not be in me. 
your faith should not be in the kind of wisdom that I bring, right? Your dependence, when you say faith, right, we are saying literally dependence, right? Your faith, your dependence should be on the on the power of God, right? So, so that should be our focus as well, right? So it's it's not wrong to pursue the heart of God because the heart of God is for the expressions of the Holy Spirit, right? So God wants to show Himself strong on our behalf, on people's behalf. God wants to express Himself, and in, through all these things, he, he wants to minister. So we should have the same heart and say, God, you know, you minister to these people, right? You minister to whoever, whomever we are sending us to, right? In all these ways, right? So we should be expectant. We should have faith as well. Okay, let's look at uh, verse six onwards. Okay, so he says, you know. Previously, he says, we, I don't want to put your faith, I want you to put your faith in wisdom of men. Okay, then he goes on to say, however, we speak wisdom to those who are mature. We bring wisdom to those who are mature. Yet, not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak wisdom, the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Okay, so verse six and seven. So he says, you know, we do speak wisdom, we do bring wisdom, but it's not the wisdom of man, right? So wisdom of man, when we look at it, it it is it could be you know humanistic philosophies, humanistic teachings, um, everything based. It could be based on reason. I'm not. We're not saying that it is bad or it is, you know, it is um, unnecessary. But the fact is that there is something which is beyond that. There is something which is over and above that, which is the wisdom of God. Right? which is the revelatory wisdom of God. And he says that this wisdom is hidden, a hidden wisdom, hidden for a purpose, you know, hidden so that we can find it, right? Hidden so that the Holy Spirit can reveal this. Now, in the dispensations past, it was hidden. But for us, God wants to reveal it for our glory. So he's saying, you know, the hidden wisdom which God ordained, verse 7, before the ages for our glory. So uh, so Paul is saying, you know, this was, this is something that God prepared for us, you know, in those ages. It was not revealed to them. They longed to know it. It was not revealed to them. But in the fullness of time, it has been revealed to us, right? So some of those things. If, if you see, you know, what are those things that are prepared for us? The kingdom of God, the kingdom itself prepared for us as people. The mystery of Christ, the gospel prepared for us, right? And about, about the believers, you know, um, how God foreknows. And because of that foreknowledge, we are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Right? That's, a, that's a beautiful thing, you know, that uh, in Christ... That we share that we share the same thing. We we share that position. We share that authority. Definitely not the deity. You know, we are still we are humans, um, and definitely not the divinity or the deity. But but God has predestined that. Okay, those who put their Christ, put their trust and faith in Christ, should come to should be conformed to the image uh, of His Son. Right. So Christ likeness is something. That um, that is, that is there for all of us, right? So, and the list goes on. Like right? good works, efficient two ten talks about the good works that are prepared for each one of us. So, which means that God has a plan, God has a purpose, God has a good work, good work led by the Spirit of God, good work. You know, which means that each of us have a a ministry. Uh, it it may not be, you know, same as the person next to us, but then he has these good works for us to discover and for us to walk in right so all that god has prepared for us and 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 this is what it is you know verse 8 says that none of the rulers of this age knew 
that all these things were coming you know where we're on their way we're going to unfold about the uh, beyond the cross right but then he says you know if they had known they would not have crucified the lord of glory okay this hidden wisdom none of the none of the high priests none of those none of the jews they did not know um know all this you know so he says the rulers of this age referring to you know the the humans the jewish rulers leaders but also referring to the powers of darkness right so saying that they did not know and uh, otherwise they would not have crucified the lord of glory okay and verse 9 very significant he says eyes i has not seen ear has not heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which god has prepared for those who love him you know this these things which we saw you know which is there in various scriptures epistles are things that god has prepared for us ephesians 2:10 and what just one of the things right god has prepared for us so he says here that eyes have not seen which means our natural eyes it has not been made known to our natural senses you know, seeing hearing and he says nor has entered into the heart of man the things that god has prepared for those who love him you know so it's god has prepared so certain things is god has prepared certain things uh, for those who love him and it is it has not been made known it is not visible to our physical senses right but he says in verse 10 god has revealed them to us through his spirit so so the whole thing doesn't stop with verse 9 you know verse 9 if you would just look at it it's like okay god has a plan god has a purpose now i don't know it right and it's impossible for man to know it it's impossible for my physical senses to comprehend right so that's where we could stop but then verse 10 goes on god has revealed them to us through his spirit for the spirit searches all things yes the deep things of god so god's will is not something or god's plan and purpose for man is not something that is hidden permanently it or hidden so that no one can find it hidden so that it can you know we cannot see hear you know no it is hidden so that with the intention of revealing through his spirit to each one of us right and yes god shows these things reveals these things in seasons you know we get a better understanding okay this is what i'm supposed to be stepping into in this season of my life and it is you know progressively unfolding in our lives right but the good thing is this that we can go to god and say god you know you're not withholding so i come with expectation you know reveal them reveal these things to us reveal the next step reveal the path ahead through your spirit okay so that's it's a privilege for us to even ask and pray and, and it is in line with his will right god reveals them to us by his spirit okay so they verse 11 and 12 so what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him even so no one knows the things of god except the spirit of god now we have received not the spirit of the world but the spirit who is from god that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by god right so we know that this is how we are god has made us spirit soul body okay so the spirit of man receives the things of god through the spirit of god right and sometimes we receive in our spirit revelation understanding mysteries and it takes a while for our mind to catch up right for our for our reason to catch up right? but then we receive in our spirit and that is why you know in in 1 corinthians 12 also paul says um yeah i think it's in yeah it's in maybe 14 where he says you know when you pray in the spirit you're praying the mysteries of god you know these hidden things which god wants to reveal when you when you say mystery you know sometimes it's like we we have the understanding that hidden things which are stay forever hidden it's a mystery i cannot know it right but the thing is that the mysteries of god are things that are uh, that god wants to reveal that are hidden for us now to our physical senses but god wants to reveal right as we seek him because that's his will right spirit of god wants god wants to reveal them by his spirit to our spirit 
Okay, and he's saying, yeah, verse 12, we have not received the spirit of the world, but we have received the Holy Spirit who is from God. Why? Now, this is very interesting, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Right? So that we might know the things that have been freely given to us. No meaning, you know, I might experience the truth. I might come to an acknowledgement. I might come to a revelation of what are those things that God has already given to me in Christ Jesus, right? That we might know the things that have been um, freely given to us by God. Okay. If you look at the book of Romans, Romans also talks about that, you know, um, the things that have been freely given to us in Christ Jesus. And, um, yeah, I think it's in... Um, Yeah, Romans 8, and if you look at uh, verses 31 and 32, right? Romans 8. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So God gives certain things. You know, we're looking at all the, the inheritance that we have in Christ, the, the blessings that we have in Christ, the blessings of Abraham, the spiritual blessings that he has already you know, granted to us, we, which we see in Ephesians 2, Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 2. And so all these things God has freely given to us. We did not earn it. You know, We don't have to perform. We don't have to do all these things. He's freely given to us in Christ. And the Holy Spirit, who is from God, we have received, not the Spirit of the world, we have received the Holy Spirit, that we might know these things. So he's the one who is a spirit of wisdom and revelation, right? So he reveals. He reveals these hidden things. He reveals these things which have not yet come to our mind, our understanding. And so, so the good thing is this, you know, if we do not understand, right? If we do not know, if we think that, okay, God, the way ahead is seems to be hidden, no need to panic, right? So that's a good thing. No need to panic. No need to be anxious, overtly anxious, because he says very here, very clearly that this is the role of the Holy Spirit, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. The verse before that, verses 9 and 10 says that, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, right? And nor has entered into the heart of man. So which means you're in that state. Eyes, I've not seen it. Ears, I've not heard it physical senses, nothing blank, nor have entered into the heart of man. You know, I've not got an idea yet. What is the will of God? What is the plan of God? What's the way ahead? I've not received it yet. He's saying, no problem, because we have the Holy Spirit, and that is what he chooses to do. Right? Verse 10, God reveals them. God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. Okay? So it's a... So he's... Um, See, he's teaching. He's telling them, you know, this is this is what it is. Um, this is what I came so that your. I mean, I came to teach so that your faith should be in the demonstration of the Holy Spirit, in the power of God. And he's going on to explain. Hey, the Holy Spirit does this. The mysteries, uh, the thing, hidden things. He comes to reveal that to each one of our hearts, right? So, yeah, so that's that's something that we can affirm. That's something that we can receive. I want to know those things that are freely given to us. I'm not going to strive. I'm going to depend. Right? My faith is in the demonstration of the Spirit. My faith is in the power of the Holy Spirit, right? And, and in the work of the Holy Spirit, in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So when we say, you know, Lord, I know that you know and your will is that I should come to the knowledge of it, right? And you want to reveal that, right? So we continue to seek Him. We continue to be at peace that the Lord will reveal, right? We put our faith in Him, okay? Okay, let's look at verses 13 onwards, right? So he says, these things we also speak, this wisdom of the Spirit, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual, okay? So um, let's take that verse. So he, he says, okay, this wisdom of God we teach. And we don't teach it in man's method, but we teach it in a way that 
how Holy Spirit teaches us, comparing the spiritual um, things with other spiritual things. And um, he, he gives us the ability. He gives us the ability. He gives us the impartation. He gives us the you know the know-how or the strategy to to communicate this. Right. So these things we speak. This wisdom of God we speak, but we don't rely on human methods. But you know, uh, in God's uh, spiritual methods. Right. It was fourteen. But the natural man does not receive the things uh, of the spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Okay, so he's talking about a, a person who is unable to receive the things of the spirit, and he calls them, calls this person, and he's saying, you know, this is a natural man. Okay, so uh, which means that he's more. <clears throat> this person is more aware of. The physical, the natural, right? And well, who is such a person? Who is that kind of a person? Is a person who is unable to receive. You know, he says this cannot receive, nor can he know them. You know, he says there's there's no ability. Why? Because that person is not open to the things. Is not the person is in other words, he's not born again, right? The spirit is dead. The spirit is not alive to God. So he says these are foolishness to him. Because these things need to be spiritually understood, spiritually discerned. Okay, so it could be a person who is not born again. It could be a person who is so, you know, maybe even born again. But this is my opinion. But then, who is so inclined or so leaning into the natural things only? Right, he's not open to the work of the spirit. He's not open to receive the work of the spirit or leading of the spirit. Right, so he's saying this natural man does not receive because it's it seems foolish, right? So some of the things of let's say even salvation itself, it seems like foolishness, right? Something an event that happened two millennia ago, you know, it seems foolish. How can I put my faith in that, right? Or the whole thing of okay, maybe even the gifts of the spirit, praying in tongues, right? Uh, or any other gift of the spirit, you know, it seems. Foolish to a person, or you know, even to maybe you know the priorities, seeking first the kingdom of God, or to walk in purity and holiness before God, you know, to walk in righteousness seems like foolishness. You know why? You know why should I put my life at risk? Why should I, you know, forego these even sometimes legally okay good things? Why should I forego that for the sake of? Someone who I've not seen, I've not you know heard, or some you know this book writes about. Why should I do it? You know, so the natural person has not experienced the spirit, experience uh, cannot experience the spirit, nor can he know them. Verse fifteen says, you know, but he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one, for who can know the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Okay, so, um, so he's talking about the natural man, and then he says, that, you know, this is what it is: a man, natural man, of course, uh, is someone who's ruled by the senses and uh, uh, whose inclination is the natural things, right? But he who's spiritual, meaning one who is uh, one who's born again, one who is also relying, depending, and open to the work of the Holy Spirit. What does he do? He you know, he uh, he judges all things, right? Judges meaning, okay, discerns. Uh, judges, when we say judge, right? Believers are called to judge. Right? Sometimes we say, you know, don't judge me or don't judge. We should not judge. Yes, we cannot. Uh, the Bible talks about not judging before the time or, uh, you know, judging uh, with um, wrong motive. Or judging with the intent to condemn, right? So those are things a believer is not supposed to do. A disciple is not supposed to do. But then, as a believer, as a follower of Christ, I am called to judge. This is one of the things. He who is spiritual judges all things, right? So judge is not a bad word. Okay, to judge means to consider the pros and cons, and then come to a conclusion. Right? Your 
that's what a judge does, right? He hears. Okay, the, he hears both sides of the story, and he hears the you know the accusation. He hears the defense, and then comes to a conclusion and brings a verdict and say, okay, this is it. This is the right thing. This is the verdict. This is the consequence of wrongdoing, and this is you know this is this should be the recompense. Right? So a judge does just does that. So we are called to judge. We are called to discern. Right? We are called, so he's saying, he spiritual judges all things. Yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. Meaning, the one who is spiritual with all these different values and standards cannot be judged rightly by someone with a varying standard. Right? For example, a natural man, a person who cannot judge or who cannot discern the things of the spirit. Obviously, the measurement, the scale you know the standard by which that person judges another one is obviously you know it's going to be very different and cannot so he's saying you know he is not rightly judged right by uh, no because they are they have two different standards and so therefore it's for a person uh, you know such a person even righteousness and everything seems foolishness so he's not able to rightly judge the one who is spiritual okay Verse 16, who has known the mind of the Lord that he may ex instruct him? Right? Um, so he's actually quoting from Isaiah 40 or referencing that. Saying, who has directed the Spirit of the Lord and who is you know, the Holy Spirit's counselor, etc.? Uh, uh, but the thing is this that we have the mind of Christ. So when we say mind, we, you know, the, all the processing, like the thoughts, uh, the decision making. Um, you know what you hold as value, uh, like the spiritual man has the mind of Christ, right? Which means a mind that is renewed, a mind that is aligned to the scriptures, right? To the ways of God. Okay, aligning meaning, you know, your sorry, brought yeah, in 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 a straight path with you know whatever is ahead, right? So. For example, if you ride a cycle, fall down, and uh, many times it's happened, right? The the cycle, the wheel is facing this side, the handle is facing this side, right? You get up and you sit. I'm sure it has happened. You sit like it's like, you know, and then you align. You just hold the bicycle. You go front. You hold the cycle's wheel, and then you bring the, you know, you you turn this uh, handle, and it comes in alignment. So you, that's how that is how it is. So the mind that is aligned. The mind that is renewed to the values, the ways of God, to the to the word of God. Now, that mind is a spiritual mind, meaning it's it's a it's a mind of a person who is in tune with the spirit, who is led by the spirit of God. So saying, you know, this is it. We have the privilege of having the mind of Christ, which is a huge privilege for the believers. So he's talking about the work of the spirit. He's saying this is, you know, and, and all this is triggered by the fact that people are saying that I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. Right? He's saying, okay, your faith should not be in me. Your faith should not be in man. Your faith should be in the Holy Spirit, in God, and in His in the demonstration of the Holy Spirit because the Spirit of God does all these things. And in explaining that, and he's saying, you know, as human beings who are led, who as believers who are led by the Spirit of God, we have this privilege of having the mind of Christ, right? So, so the invitation, if a person is more naturally inclined, you know, is, is not able to receive things of the Spirit, you move from being a natural man to a spiritual man, right? So because a natural man cannot, right? if you're going to be ruled only by your physical senses, if you're going to make decisions only by what you see, uh, what you are able to, you know, um, rationalize, and what makes sense to your mind. It's not you are cutting off a huge avenue of receiving from God, right? So he is talking about that the natural man, and then we have the mind of Christ. Okay. So and then you know when we go into chapter three, he's again talking about the division. Right, it, talking about the carnality. Okay, so he's talking about another facet or another aspect of the human mind. He spoke about the natural man, 
he spoke about you know a mind that is not uh, you know not spirit led he's talking about he's going to talk about a carnal mind now right so he he is is going to talk about that in chapter 3 okay let's uh, let's read through chapter 3 verse 1 and i brethren could not speak to you as to spiritual people but as to carnal as to babes in christ i fed you with milk and not with solid food for until now you are not you were not able to receive it and even now you are still not able for you are still carnal for where there are envy strife and divisions among you are you not carnal and behaving like mere men for when one says i am of paul and another i am of apollos are you not carnal Okay, so the previous chapter he talked about the spiritual mind. He talked about you know we have the actually we have the mind of Christ. It's a privilege. It's a privilege to be led by the Spirit. So what our mind cannot you know even receive, the Spirit of God is able to lead us into all those things, right? And a spiritual person is able to judge, discern those things rightly. Okay, now he's talking about the fact that hey, but you are not in that place yet. Right? He's saying you are still carnal. What does carnal mean? Carnal is soulish, fleshly. Right? Uh, a carnal mind is something that is um, resting or completely focused on one thing. It could be the appetites of the flesh, or it could be you know completely unrenewed, very indifferent to the. Uh, to what god wants god's desires are okay so if you look at romans chapter 8 again right let's uh, go to romans 8 okay romans 8 um it talks about the carnal mind right so romans 8 and verse um Let's read from verse four onwards. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Verse five: For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. Verse six: For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. because the carnal mind is enmity against god for it is not subject to the law of god nor indeed can be so then those who are in the flesh cannot please god but you are not in the flesh but in the spirit if indeed the spirit of god dwells in you now if anyone does not have the spirit of christ he is not his and so on right so he's is describing okay this is what a carnal mind is right a mind that is Uh, that is dwelling that is focused on the things of the flesh right and uh, but he says you know those who live according to the spirit now that is the opposite of that right they live according to the spirit they their mind is on the things of the spirit okay and he is also saying you know to be carnally minded has its consequence what is the consequence death separation in eventually uh, in other words he's saying you know like if you're carnally minded you're going to make carnal choices and if you make carnal choices they are not according to the spirit of god and since they are not according to the spirit of god they're going to lead you further and further away from the plan and purposes of god even the destiny that god has for you so at one point you could even you know completely be separated from god so that is why saying to be carnally minded leads you to a destination to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace okay So here he is telling the people, you are carnal. Why? The proof of carnality is division. He is saying, you know, verse three. There is envy, which means jealousy. There is strife. You guys are fighting constantly. There is division. You know, there is all these separation and factions and so on. So he is saying, you know, you are you are jealous. You are fighting, and you have you know all these separations. Are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? so another lesson for us take away for us is that we as believers we are not called to behave like mere men that could be the popular thing to do that could be a, you know in in a community in a society that we live in that could be the in thing that could be you know that could be the value 
but then we are not called to be so right we are different in other words we are called to live uh, with a spiritual mindset right so we are not called to be carnal so um, yes these are symptoms of carnality and uh, we need to put away those carnal things and he's saying you know you are you know, if you look at uh, verse 1 chapter 3 verse 1 he's saying you are carnal you are still spiritual babes you know babies right infants right and what does he say you know i had to feed you something because you were in infants because you had this mindset you could not receive solid food right so that is what happens right infants they need food because their digestion is still uh, not in place they're not able to digest they're not able to take in solid food right they don't have the capacity for solid food because they are uh, infants babies so that's the same thing that he's saying you don't have the capacity to receive solid food because of your carnality so so it's a warning for the church you know if you're going to be carnal you won't have the capacity inbuilt capacity you won't have it to receive solid food from god right the things that he has for you well you might want it but you don't have the capacity to receive it and walk in it because you are still carnal right okay so we'll stop here and come back after the break